To sell or not to sell? That is the question. I'm Kathy Fedke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Many people say never sell your real estate, but is that always true? On today's show, we're going to explore when it might make sense to sell your property and 1031 exchange it for a better property or maybe just more property. Joining us today are our two investment counselors at Real Wealth, Joe Torre and Aristotle Compass. They have been advising thousands of our members at Real Wealth for many, many years. They are investors themselves and they've been giving so much good advice. I wanted to bring them on today to answer this question. When is it time to sell and when is it not time to sell? So Joe and Aristotle, welcome to The Real Well Show. Hi, good to be here. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Yeah, we haven't really done this uh, with both of you on at the same time. So uh, if you speak over each other, that's okay. You could also just put your hand up and that's how we'll know that you want to speak. So lately, we've been throwing this term around called portfolio rebalancing, which is really the idea of looking at your portfolio and deciding, is it, I guess, overweighted on one side and does it need some rebalancing? So, um, Joe, I'll just ask you, how do you define portfolio rebalancing? Well, it's just that it's uh, you take a look at your portfolio every year and see uh, if your properties have gone up in value. Uh, you might have a lot of equity tied up and you might want to redeploy that equity somewhere else. I have a friend who owns over 200 single family homes. And every year he does a review of his portfolio and gets rid of the bottom 5% and then redeploys the capital somewhere else. So what he's doing is basically getting rid of the stuff at the bottom and reallocating it to the top. So he, he keeps uh, refreshing his portfolio and keep it performing optimally. Okay. So in, in that case, it sounds like a, a rebalancing is, is looking at perhaps the properties that aren't cash flowing as well, or maybe not appreciating as much yeah. versus or having a maintenance, maintenance expenses going up. So at that point he just cuts them loose. Yeah, totally smart. Yeah. Some people say hold your real estate forever, but I, I don't agree. Not every real estate, not every piece of property deserves to be held forever. <laughs> so Aristotle, how do you define portfolio rebalancing? I uh, did it with Joe said. Yeah, definitely. I think, Every five, six years or so, I think everyone should go back and look at their properties that they've purchased and and, and, and look and see if it's cash flowing the way you want it to, uh, or maybe you're just having maintenance after maintenance after maintenance, and maybe it's time to just get rid of that property and deploy that capital somewhere else. Or maybe you just bought a property and you just didn't realize you had so much equity in it and it's time to do something with it because like that old adage, you can't eat your equity is true. You have a lot of equity sitting in your home. Maybe you're making a hundred dollars a month in cash flow, or maybe you're breaking even, but you have a lot of equity sitting there and it's wise to re re revisit this idea of pulling money out and redeploying that. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, you get rid of your overperformers because they've gone up in value so much. You can redeploy the capital somewhere else. And your underperformers are the ones that are starting to have maintenance expenses. So at the two extremes, that's where you look at uh, what to rebalance. I mean, that's really what Real Wealth was based on, was so many investors in California sitting on properties that had, had grown so much in value, but the rents hadn't grown at all or hardly at all. So we, we found people... Who had bought maybe in 2009, 2010, those properties tripled or quadrupled in value. The rents didn't. Um, and so it just made sense. So Joe, what, what kind of stories, and you don't have to say any names, but kind of investor experiences you've seen at Real Wealth where people have really changed their lives by making a few changes to their portfolio? Oh, well, I've had several investors who <clears throat> sold properties in California and bought 10 to 20 properties elsewhere in the country and generated a lot of cash flow that they couldn't have gotten here in California. And then uh, they were able to retire in one case, retire about five or 10 years earlier than she thought she could. So yeah, using that equity in an appreciated market, the, the home values go up faster than rents. So you wind up having a lot of equity and not as much cash flow. You can use that capital elsewhere and get more cash flow. 
just again, another reason why um, the old adage of never sell a property just doesn't make sense in this case. I mean, some people would say, why don't they just do a refinance, take the cash out and keep the property because it's going to keep growing possibly if it's in California. I mean, what, what do you think of that? It's possible to do a, a refi, but right now interest rates are relatively high. <clears throat> so a refi or a home equity line of credit on your rental, uh, the number, it's really hard to make the numbers work. Uh, rates are supposed to come down in September, starting in September. So maybe this time next year, that'll be a viable strategy. But right now, it seems the best way to, to redeploy the capital is to do a 1031 exchange into more properties. Yeah, and also just, it's a little scary to me to have so many eggs in one basket. You know, what mm -hmm. if there is an earthquake or what if, you know, something happens to the economy in the Bay Area and you've got a million or two million dollar property that if it goes vacant, you're 100 percent vacant. Whereas if mm -hmm. you sold it and 1031 exchanged it into 10 or in some cases, like you said, we have, we've had people who have bought as many as 20 properties from selling just one. Now you're pretty well diversified. So, Aristotle, what kind of um, real wealth stories have have you seen in clients that you've helped really redesign their portfolio over the years? Yeah, well, recently I'm seeing a lot of uh, investors who have purchased in like the lower price point range, like in Detroit or, you know, some inexpensive property because they, they got excited by the cash flow and the price point, right? It seems like every month I run into an investor who is, lives in California and then they see a property in some you know, market that's fifty thousand dollars, and say, "Hey, what can go wrong? I want to buy that property." And whether they finance or they pay cash, right? We've heard this before, and then over the years, is it could just turn into a nightmare, right? Because those areas and those low price points and those low rent uh, points are just not very. They don't usually. They don't usually. I say usually, but they don't usually pan out to be very good investments. And so I'm finding. Lately, in the last uh, six to 12 months, I've been seeing people who own those types of properties wanting to get rid of them and get into either new construction or just something that's going to be in a better area. So, Yeah, Rich and I have personally done that. We've sold a couple of properties that we did pay $50,000 for, um, and they did go up in value. You know, they doubled, in some cases tripled in value, still pretty inexpensive properties, but it, it it's kind of the same idea that, wow, there's so much equity in these. Has the rents, have the rents gone up enough to justify it or could we make more money elsewhere? Um, so Joe, mm -hmm. in your personal investing, uh, have you done this? Oh yeah, I've done it several times. I had uh, two houses in Phoenix that I bought a long time ago and I sold them in 2018. But they had gone up quite a bit. And uh, I sold one and bought three houses in Huntsville, Alabama for cash flow with that one. And then the other house I sold and I bought two houses in Port Ritchie, Florida, which is north of Tampa, uh, mostly for appreciation. And so I turned two houses into five. So that's a great way to build your portfolio. You know, five houses cash flowing will be better than two houses and five houses appreciating will do better than two houses. And now those two houses in Port Ritchie, Florida have gone up by over 100,000 each. So now I'm thinking of doing it again and turning those two houses either into four houses or two duplexes that cash flow really well. And so is that true now looking back at the houses that you sold in Phoenix? Phoenix has been a pretty high appreciating market. Had you just left it untouched, would the portfolio look that different? Yeah, because... Uh, I left some money on the table there because uh, after I, uh, they went up over a hundred thousand and after I sold them, they went up another hundred thousand. I mean, how am I supposed to know the fed was going to bring interest rates down to near zero? There's no way to <laughs> right. predict that. Uh, it shouldn't have happened, but it did. Yeah. So if I held on to them, I could have had more equity and I could have 1031 into 10 properties, you know, but you know, there's no way to really predict that part of this business of 1031 ing is to know when's, when is the market plateauing? Are days on market increasing? Is inventory increasing? Uh, the number of uh, multiple offers on properties is declining. There are price drops, things like that happening. It shows you, uh, though it's had a run up, it's kind of tapering off, and that's the time to know that uh, it's good to get out. But if it's still on the upswing, you might want to hold on to the property longer. Yeah, and then like you said, the properties that you exchange into also grew in value. You True. just had more of them. So, yeah, it's not like you really missed out. And if anything, you diversified. Whoops. Yes. Yeah, if anything, you diversified more. Because like I said, um, if you have one property and it goes vacant, you're 100% vacant. But if you sold that property and bought two or three, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three, and one of those goes vacant, 
you still got income coming from the other one. So Correct. diversification is nice. All right, Aristotle, what about you? Have you um, bought or sold or are you a holder? <laughs> yeah, well, real quick before I dive into that, I just wanted to say that going back to the, I was talking about the, the lower price point properties, um, those those could be great stepping stones for you to get into mm-hmm. a, yeah. a, a better property. So let's say you don't have a lot of capital, but you want to get started getting into that property. Now, it will take you longer to build up equity, like in a market, like a linear market, like Cleveland or Birmingham, Alabama, uh, because appreciation is not as much. But again, it's a stepping stone. You hold it for a while, and then maybe when the time is right, you sell it and you or you pull money out of it. Um, but in my personal portfolio, so I'm, I'm not, well, okay. I am a holder I'm right now. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been investing for only about 10 years and I just, just in general, I'm not a person who sells things. I'm not a hoarder, but I don't like to sell things because I know I'm going to regret it selling it, uh, down the road. And so I haven't, uh, my properties are performing pretty well for the most part. I haven't had many issues with them, but I have this one property. I actually have two properties in Huntsville. Joe has some there as well, but I bought a few of those. I think I think it's been five years now, maybe six years, and those have appreciated really nicely. So my plan is to not sell them, but to refinance and pull money out. Now, I did some number crunching, and by the way, if anyone who's listening to this hasn't seen, we did a webinar with our one of our preferred lenders, Richard Avani, about two weeks ago. It's on our website. And he did a fantastic job educating our members and myself and, and everyone uh, about scenarios about uh, about what he's actually doing with his current property. He talked about either doing a refinance, pulling, uh, uh, doing a 1031, or just selling the property. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, yeah, 1031 cash or refinance or HELOC. I'm sorry, yeah. So he talked about those three scenarios. And so my scenario, I'm probably going to just pull money out and, and do a refinance. And I did the numbers. If I did it now, like what Joe said, there are the, the refinance rate is a little higher than a purchase loan rate. So it's a little higher right now. But even if I did a re- refinance now, I could pull out about 70000 out of one of my houses. And that one property would break even almost. I think I did the math. It was like $11 I would, I would, I would break even, give or take. Um, and then, But I would be acquiring a whole other asset. My net worth would go up. I, let's just say I buy a property for two hundred fifty thousand. I would increase my net worth by two hundred fifty thousand, and then that property would be cash flowing, let's say one hundred fifty dollars right now, right? So, so I'm not robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, but I'm actually it's a lateral move, and I'm building up my portfolio because in my scenario, I'm I don't plan on retiring anytime soon, so I don't need the income right now from the properties. So I'm just building up my portfolio, so I have. A uh, large amount of assets when the time does come to retire, and then I'll have a large, a larger nest egg at that point. Yeah, they, you make such a great point about what you're trying to achieve and what stage of life you're in. Uh, you know, Joe, let's let's start with you. Let's say I come to real wealth, and I'm a tech worker in San Francisco in my 30s. I make over 100000 a year, which doesn't go very far in the Bay Area and doesn't allow me to really buy a house. What would, what would you recommend for me to get in the game? Well, for someone that young, I would say your goal should be to build equity, <clears throat> build up a lot of equity, but invest in appreciating markets where demand is greater than supply and prices are going up uh, and get in there. And, you know, you can buy a $250,000 house, like Aristotle said. And five to seven or ten years from now, it'll be three hundred fifty. You know, so you got a hundred thousand in equity there. If you can buy ten houses, then your net worth went up by a million dollars. You know, just buy ten houses and wait ten years, and uh, then when you get closer to retirement, you can ten thirty one those properties into cash flowing properties like fourplexes, because uh, they've gone up enough that you can afford to buy a fourplex and then convert your equity into cash flow uh, as you get closer to retirement. But someone starting out should invest for appreciation. Also. When, you, when you're investing, uh, the longer it takes for you to get into an appreciation market, the more it's going to cost you. So that 250 house that Aristotle is going to buy is going to be 275 next year and two, uh, 300 the year after. So the longer you wait, uh, the harder it is to get in. Whereas a $150,000 house in Cleveland, you can buy that anytime. You know, there's no sense of urgency. For appreciation, you should get in as soon as you can. Well, so many people are thinking the opposite. They're thinking the longer they wait, the the lower prices will eventually come because they keep hit, hitting new highs. How could that How could that happen? How come there isn't a downturn? Um, either one of you jump into that because, you know, we are making assumptions with with growth properties and appreciation. Nobody knows for sure, but 
why do you think that that prices would continue to rise versus what some people are waiting for the crash? Well, I, I can answer that. Right. I have a kind of a, a relative story. So my sister about a week ago texted my brother and myself and my dad a, a home that we lived in, our first home that my dad uh, built or he, he had built, right? It was a brand new home. And uh, I was born in 78, so you can do the math. Uh, but I think he bought it. I want to say he probably bought it around 79 or 80 or something like that, right? I, I was born in that house or maybe I was just shortly after that. And I, my, and, um, my sister sent the home and I think it was 400. This is in St. Louis, Missouri. The home was priced at 450,000. Okay. It's like a ranch style four bedroom home. And my dad jumped in. He said, I bought that house for $84,000. Like that's insane. Uh, and my, and my brother replied back and my, my brother's also in the, mortgage business he said well in today's you know economy in today's inflation environment that home would be worth like three hundred and fifty thousand. so it makes sense but to your point is that homes do go up and down but they always in the end are going to be up just like everything else i mean look at uh coca-cola look at a hamburger everything is always going to be more expensive in the future so if you're thinking that a three hundred thousand dollar house in dallas is going to be worth two hundred thousand in ten years you're wrong you're wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's what my take is. Yeah. And I would add that if you look at the economics of the market you're investing in, you want to see what the supply demand dynamics are. If there's job growth and population growth, like certain areas of Florida, there's tons of people moving to Florida's population grew by 350,000 people last year. That's basically 100,000 households. And they can't build houses fast enough. 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day. Florida is the number one destination. So as demand for housing is continually going up and the people who move there, it's not just the bodies, it's the money they bring with them. You know, uh, somebody sells a house in Manhattan and buys a house all cash in Florida, the price is nothing and they drive the prices uh, continually up. So as long as the supply and demand uh, dynamics are are strong, you can uh, be pretty sure that there's going to be an increase in price appreciation. Yeah, I love that you gave that context because I, I just did an interview earlier today on a different podcast where we talked about how if you're young, again, in your 30s, and you're perfectly capable of having a job, that's where your income should come from. And on the side, you're building this, you know, nest egg for the future, which could be in the stock market, it could be in real estate. Uh, But what too often people do when they're young is they go for the properties that cash flow, but don't really appreciate. For example, if you bought a property, like you said, in um, but let's just pick a market, but how about Jackson, Mississippi, which has been kind of a popular cash flow market, but hasn't been a real wealth uh, market for us because we just don't see the growth there at this time. Well, if you bought a property in Jackson 20 years ago, it might not be that different in price today. So you really didn't do yourself any favors except spend a lot of money on the upkeep of a house that is basically valued the same. So Joe, how do we at Real Wealth find these markets that satisfy either the cash flow investor or the growth investor? I mean, what are the key points that we're looking for? Well, for the growth investor, we're looking for, like I said, job growth, population growth, uh, infusion of money into an area, uh, companies opening factories, um, diverse economies. So single industry towns tend to suffer during recessions. So uh, you want a diverse economy. When a market has those characteristics, it tends to go up in value. And a limit on supply. I mean, the reason San Francisco is so expensive is because it's seven miles by seven miles. And there's a limit on how much, how many houses can be there. Manhattan is 22 square miles. It's also expensive because there's a limit on supply. So anytime you have supply and demand out of whack, when there's much more demand than supply, then prices should go up. As far as a cash flow market, then that's mostly the population's um, pretty, pretty flat, linear. Uh, there's a lot of inventory on the market that can be uh, built, uh, renovated, and put on the market. And there's a lot of renters, like Cleveland's a perfect example. You have the Cleveland Clinic there. There's a lot of nurses and x-ray technicians and ambulance drivers, those kind of people that make great tenants. They're in a very stable industry, and the property's cash flow. Yeah, to give you an example, I grew up in the San Francisco <clears throat> Peninsula. Joe, I know that you lived there. Aristotle, you've been more in Southern California. But there's, you know, it's a peninsula. So you've got the bay on one side, you've got the ocean on the other. The house that I lived, I moved And mountains in between. And mountains in between. (laughs) 
Um, the house that my dad paid $99,000 for, granted, no, nothing is the same as the San Francisco Bay Area or New York City. I just I just Zillowed 70 Santiago, the, the house I grew up in. My dad paid $99,000, and that was a lot of money. It was considered a very high-end neighborhood. The Zillow estimate is $9.7 million. So, again, there is... A- some merit to what wow. you said, job growth. And the funny thing is when that house, he paid 99000 it went up to a million. He thought he really, really hit the jackpot, sold it for a million. A couple of years later, it was worth three or four million. And he went from elated to depressed, you know, just like that, because that was one of those properties. Yeah, probably would have been good to keep, but, um, you know, you never know. All right, Aristotle, I had asked Joe earlier what somebody with a hundred thousand dollar salary who's in their thirties would do. What about somebody, you know, clients that come to us who are in their fifties or sixties, or they're close to retirement in the past. um, Many financial planners would say, absolutely don't invest in, in real estate in your later years because you need time. Real estate takes time to grow. Um, What would you say about that for the people who come uh, at, at age 50 and 60? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I've spoken to a few of those individuals recently in the last week. Um, and um, some people are fortunate to have cash in the retirement account. So I would say if you have cash in the IRA or something, uh, pay cash for a property, right? Then you can enjoy the benefits of the cash flow today and not have to worry about paying a loan down. Um, if you're not so lucky to have all that kind of cash laying around, uh, then I, I would suggest going for a multifamily or cash flowing property so you can enjoy the cash flow today. Because, I mean, um, a, a lot of people I speak to, they want to leave their properties to their heirs and their kids and things like that. And that we all want to do that. I'm planning on doing that too. Uh, so I have a trust set up for all that. But I would say at that point in life, if you are going to use the cash flow, part of the cash flow to live off of, then absolutely you need to focus on cash flow. And multifamily is a great entry point, a two to four unit, small multifamily. You don't have to get into anything large, but a two to four unit property that's going to spin off anywhere from 500 to a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a month. Cash flow would be a lot better than buying a, a house that's going to cash flow $150 a month, right? So I would, Look at multifamily and focus more on cash, though, at the same time. Joe, what are your thoughts? Same thing. I would, if, if they have the capital to buy a fourplex, because then you have four doors. Uh, not only do you get more cash flow per invested dollar, but you also have more stable cash flow. Because if somebody leaves, you still have three people paying rent. And then that's more than enough to cover your mortgage. So the, the cash flow is more stable. The trick there is to make sure that you stagger the leases so they don't all expire at the same time. Have some expire in April, some in May, some in you know September or whatever. But if you spread them out, then you'll have very consistent and higher cash flow. Yeah, and my response is, 50 and 60, that's pretty young today. Mm. So it used to be that, you know, people would retire at 65 and die three years later. It's not like that anymore. That's when I started investing. That was kind of the theory is, um, you know, enjoy your life while you got it. But people are living into their 80s and 90s. If you're in your 50s and you're buying a, a property, like Joe said, in a fast growing area, in 10 years, by the time you're 60 or 70, you may have created a whole lot of income that you might not have gotten otherwise. And, uh, you know, your time's going to pass no matter what. I mean, my mother-in-law is 87 and we just took her on a, a two week tour of Scotland, which was not the easiest tour. Like you're walking around and there's, you know, she's healthy as can be. So if she had started investing in, at 50, and those homes were paid off by 80. She's 87. She would have seven years of those properties paid off. And just, you know, she'd be treating us to that Scotland trip. I hope she's listening. No. Uh, so do, do you know what I'm saying? Like people are living longer. 50 and 60 is not old anymore. No. You're, and, you're, and you're right, Kathy. People are outliving their money these days, right? And that's a scary part. People who are relying on their uh, on Social Security, which I, I don't know. I hate to say this, but again, I'm 45. I, I don't know if Social Security will even be around when I retire. I mean, it may not be. Or right? if it is, it might be very, very little. So I can't depend on that. Uh, but I do know that the technology, medical advancement, people are living, like you said, they're living healthy in their 80s and 90s. And if you don't have any kind of income to support that or you're 
if your, your retirement accounts run out by the time you're 75, yeah, what else are you going to have? So that's why I think rental, I think everybody should have at least one rental property in their portfolio. Even if you don't plan on becoming a huge investor and owning 500 homes or like Joe's said, that client has 200 homes, you don't need to go big. You just need a few and that can help support your lifestyle when you get older. That's called longevity risk where you, know, you run out of money before you run out of life. And so um, what do you do about that? You know, if, if you have stocks and you sell them, you know, you could eventually run out. But an income property will continually produce income indefinitely, you know, as long as it's well maintained. So uh, you can hold that forever and pass it on to your heirs. Love it. All right, you guys, you're I'm just so proud that you are our investment counselors at Real Wealth. I just know that our investors are in such good hands because you're the real deal. You invest um, the other investment counselor, Leah College, is also a very heavy investor, uh, very, very um, active. All you know, all of us are are still active in in buying property and rebalancing. As we as we talked about, um, Aristotle, you had said you want to look at your portfolio every five years. I'm kind of in the camp of like every year, and you should be looking at your portfolio hmm. every month, but definitely doing a deep dive once a year. Like just how much has insurance gone up? How much have property taxes gone up? Is there a bunch of CapEx that I'm going to have to do? Would it be better for me to sell it now, not do that and have someone else do it? And um, we just we just did that with a Cleveland property. That property did really well for us, but it was getting older. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to deal with all the, the um, expenditures I probably have coming up. So we sold it for maybe 10,000 under market, but I think the repairs would have been far, far above that. So for us, it was just easier. We're just going to put it into something newer that we don't have to worry about. So anyway, I'm proud to have you as part of our Real Wealth team for so long. Both of you have been around since, I don't know, Aristotle, when did you start with Real Wealth? So next year will be my 10th year. Can you that, Kathy? I started I, in 2015, I believe. If, wow. And Joe? Was- uh, August 1st was my eight-year anniversary. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So we just have um, just the honor of, of you guys being with us that long and, and helping handhold so many of our investors along the way through so many changes to the economy and to the world and to the real estate market and just handholding our investors through that process. So thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, well, well, and thanks to you, Kathy. All, all your shows and all the guests you have, and then all the all of our content and our resources and our partners that we work with. I mean, like it just the education is is awesome. And so, I, even though I'm talking to clients every day, I'm still learning stuff all the time. And so, it's it's uh, our company is just is so awesome with all the education. I'm, I'm don't mean to toot our own horn, but it, it really is awesome here. We got a lot of great content for our listeners. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. it, it is a constant process of learning. I can't believe I've been doing this show for 20 years and there's still content. There's still things to talk about because there's always more to learn and the market's always changing. So Aristotle and Joe, thank you so much for being here on the Real Well Show again together, trying this out. I think it was awesome. Uh, if people want to speak with you or get in touch with you, they can go to realwealthshow.com and join. It's free to join. And then you can have access to our awesome investment counselors. For some reason, we don't charge for this service. <laughs> people ask us why that's crazy. We've talked about it. Leo was looking at a program where uh, people would charge for the coaching, but we haven't done that. And It's not like you can be coaching people every day or once a week, but you are there to answer questions and to help people with hard decisions of what to do, how to get started or what to do with their portfolio if they feel stuck and they they want to grow it. So again, you could go to realwealthshow.com and join and you'll get access to our awesome investment counselors, Joe, Aristotle and Leah. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show and Joe and us, Aristotle, and we will see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.